has to get in the zone. You know. Well, howdy, 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 and welcome to the Real Faith Live Show. While the world is getting darker, Real Faith is getting a little hotter and a little brighter. Welcome to the 100th episode of the Real Faith Live Show! Nadia, I heard you had some big plans for New Year's Eve. I did. One of my friends got engaged. Oh, boy. Yeah. Were you involved in that? I mean, I helped set it up. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, we're praying for them. Uh, so, guys, we are here at the Real Faith Live Show, which that is the show that happens before the sermon. Mm -hmm. We tell you guys lots of fun stuff. We do a giveaway. We're even giving away a truck. That just ended, so that uh, guy's pretty happy with this yep. truck. Driving around Very in Fredrickson. Awesome. <laughs> uh, at Trinity Church in Scottsdale, Arizona, Pastor Mark preaches live, mm -hmm. and then we put it out for all the world to see here at Real Faith. If you guys love hearing the gospel preached, it's because Real Faith uh, meets every week and has a staff and a team mm -hmm. that gets the Bible teaching out. So thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. Um, so, what series are we wrapping up today? We are wrapping up our Family Systems series this week. Do you know what we're learning about this last week? Differentiation. What is differentiation? I don't know. What is differentiation? Well, I don't know. Pastor Mark has to tell us. Yeah, it's probably good to just let him share. So, Nadia, what's been your biggest takeaway? My biggest takeaway is that sometimes some people just need to be cut off, you know? It seems like something you're kind of excited about. <laughs> all right, don't, uh, don't be like Nadia. Don't be excited to cut people off. Uh, make sure you're doing all your research. Yeah. Make sure you know if they're truly toxic. And the way you can find out if they're truly toxic is go to realfaith.com slash cleave. Mm. And we have a whole test where you can put family members through. Really? And uh, we have a score at the end. And it'll tell, tell you that. whether you should cut them off or not. I might use that later. Just kidding, none of that's there, but there are an excellent set of classes yeah. and a workbook and another book and all kinds of resources for you guys to mm -hmm. dive deep and to be jumping into all of this stuff. So um, these resources address uh, that very topic mm -hmm. um, and Pastor Mark's teaching is very practical, yeah. as you know. I know. Um, so if you're getting married, you're planning on getting married, you've mm -hmm. ever been married, you have children or ever plan to have children, or you are a child, this will be really helpful for so you. So that's everyone. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And starting next week, what is Pastor Mark jumping into? Pastor Mark is starting a new series on judges. Is that like Judge Judy and stuff? Maybe. All the different judges on TV? Yeah, no? <laughs> Pastor Mark's jumping into an epic new series mm -hmm. in the book of Judges, focusing on three larger than life characters, Ooh. Deborah, Gideon and Samson, and All that right. wasn't a fat joke. Um, okay. <laughs> Nadia, who is your favorite character out of those three? I love Deborah. Oof. She's pretty cool. <laughs> um, hmm. Why is Deborah your favorite? She's like my superhero. Where's my super suit? You're not going to want to miss this series. It'll be epic, and I'm going to let Pastor Mark tell you more. Well, 2024, we got some uh, fun Bible teaching lined up. We're going to deal with three character studies in the Old Testament book of Judges. Think kind of Marvel Universe, uh, broken but uh, anointed superhero. We're going to start uh, by looking at the life of Deborah. Incredible, brave, strong woman. Uh, question is, uh, how does that translate to women today? And is Deborah the original feminist? Spoiler alert, no, but you'll need to tune in. And then we're going to pivot over and look at a guy named Gideon. He starts as fearful and timid, but then he becomes anointed and powerful. And uh, he is not perfect, but we see that God does perfect work through imperfect people. And then we're going to jump into the life of Samson. And he is the definition of a hot mess. Uh, he is anointed of God, a powerful man of God. Uh, but as is often the case, uh, a, a wicked woman uh, jumps in and she changes the storyline. If you're a guy with a crazy girlfriend, uh, you may want to jump ahead and just read a little bit on Samson. And if you're that gal, read Delilah, repent and become Deborah. That's where we're going this 
year. It's going to be super fun, deep character study in the Old Testament, looking at uh, these three magnificent Old Testament Holy Spirit anointed characters, Deborah, Gideon, and Samson. Oh my. If you've been loving all these resources and sermons, you can text it bold to 99383 and we'll send you a link to get our app where there's tons of exclusive content, tons of awesome stuff, ebooks, all kinds of stuff in the app. So text bold to 99383. Mm -hmm. Real Faith is 100% funded by ministry partners just like you. And in 2023, we saw people meet Jesus like never before, thanks to courageous Bible teaching, getting out to the masses. But we need your help to continue to do that in 2024. So if you'd like to become a partner, you can visit realfaith.com slash partner to donate. And there you can make a one-time donation or set up recurring giving. Thank you for partnering <laughs> with us and helping us tell more people it's all about Jesus. And Nadia, without further ado, what time is it? It's service time! Service time! Okay, that was an emotionally awkward transition. I'll just acknowledge that publicly. Um, we went from Armageddon and the end of the world to do, 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 do. welcome to the Jetsons. And uh, uh, the good news is uh, we're finishing a sermon series this weekend, uh, How to Leave and Cleave. And uh, we just got done with the holidays. Don't raise your hand. This is a rhetorical question, but how many of you would like to improve relationships with family members? Okay, good. Uh, that being said, uh, that's exactly what we're talking about today. And we did just finish the holidays. And for some of you, uh, it was a good season, but it could have been better. For some of you, it was difficult and you wanna make it better next year. And so really the timing is great. And as we begin the new year, I'm just gonna plug this uh, family systems workbook that I wrote for you. It's 21 days, it's about 45,000 words, and you just need to do it and go through the process. And if you're married, go through it together. And if your in-laws act like outlaws, send them a copy too. And, uh, and what I would say is uh, if you're here and part of our church family, you can pick up a copy uh, on the way out. In the bookstore, you can scan the QR code in front of you and we'll send you a free PDF copy. If you're watching online, they'll give you uh, the assets so that you can go ahead and get that for yourself. That being said, we will conclude the family systems today. And so I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna get to work, okay? You guys ready to go? Yeah. All right, let's do this. Father, thanks for an opportunity to talk about family, something that is so crucial to your heart as father. We're here as a church family inviting the Holy Spirit to help us to understand family in a way that is healthy and biblical and that would follow the principles you give in your word. God, I pray against any bitterness or distraction or discouragement, and we invite you, Holy Spirit, to help us to determine what your will is for our life, for our marriage, for our children and our grandchildren, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're dealing with how to architect a family system, and the overarching reason is it's not just about you or your marriage or your children. There's a system that governs your family, how you interact and think, and that can have generational implications. And if the system isn't rightly set, then the individuals and the marriages and the relationships within the context of the family system, they invariably suffer. We've established one sort of foundational scripture that we've built the entire series on, and I'll read it one last time. Genesis 2, 24 and 25. And again, this is written before sin enters the world. This is God's perfect divine design. And Jesus quotes it in Matthew 19, four through six, and Mark 10, five through nine. And then Paul quotes it in Ephesians 5, 31. So if the Holy Spirit says it through Moses, Jesus, and Paul, we should pay attention. Here, here we go. Therefore shall a man, a man shall leave his mother and father, this is important. It doesn't talk about the daughter. It says in the scriptures that daughters are given in marriage and that men take a wife. So to prepare to take a wife, a man must leave his father and mother, 
cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. That's consummation of the marital covenant. They were both naked, or if you're from Texas, naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. There's our foundational scripture. And in saying this, um, this is the bedrock for marriage and family. And uh, what we've also done is I put together a simple chart for you. These are kind of the leave and cleave options. We started with enmeshment. This is where you don't leave your mother and father. You don't differentiate. You don't become an adult. You don't launch. You're too emotionally, financially, practically connected to your parents or your siblings that you can't become a differentiated adult. On the other side is cutoff. This is where either your family cuts you off or you cut a member or members of your family off. All of our families have some branches that have been sawn off uh, of the family tree. In the middle, there is always some form of tension. And oftentimes in a marriage, it can be between the husband and wife. So when we got married, Grace leaned toward enmeshment, I leaned toward cutoff. The goal is to get to differentiation. Each of these was a sermon. Today we'll deal with differentiation. This is where you love your mother and father, but you leave your father and mother. You're connected to your family, but you're not codependent with your family. You care about your family, but you're not carrying your family. That being said, when we're getting into this issue of differentiation, and that is our word, this is a foundational, crucial concept. And if you don't understand this, you're not going to have a good marriage, you're not going to have healthy children, and you're not going to have a great family for generations. In the workbook, I explain differentiation this way. Differentiation is the process where a person goes from being a child who is a member of a family to an adult who's ready to have their own family. And the Bible uses this language of leave and cleave. And we've established that when you're growing up, your attachment and connection is to your parents and your siblings and your biological family. You begin the differentiation process, which we'll talk about today. And then eventually you leave your mother and father so that you can cleave or pursue and prioritize your marriage and a new family. And now what we have is not a family, but two families. That's what we've established. That being said, this is such a major concept that even non-Christian counselors have coined the term cornerstone concept. This is foundational and generations get built on this cornerstone concept. Uh, In addition, I just wanna say a few things about differentiation. Uh, It is a process. You don't go from a child to an adult in an instant, it's a process. And let me say, it's a process for the parents and the children. If you're a child and you're in the differentiation process, it'll take some years and you've never gone through this before, so it's new for the child. But I'll just say this as a parent and now grandparent, it's also a process for the parents and the grandparents. Like as soon as we had our first daughter and I held her, my first thought was, I don't know what I'm doing, okay? (laughs) Now, many years later, holding her grandchild, I would still say, I still don't know what I'm doing. Um, But you know, it's a process where you learn as you go. And so there needs to be a lot of grace and a lot of conversation, and there needs to be an understanding that mistakes will be made. Sometimes feelings will be hurt, but if you love each other, you work it through. Uh, I'll give you some examples. in the differentiation process where different children will differentiate in different ways. And all differentiation means is this, you're different. You're growing up in a family and all of a sudden you realize, I'm not like my sister, I'm not like my brother. You get married, you're like, our marriage isn't exactly like our parents. You have children, like I'm not gonna raise my kids exactly like my parents did. And let me say this, that's not because you judge them or you reject them or you criticize them, you're just different. It doesn't mean that they're always bad or wrong, just means you're different. Give you some examples. Um, I, my wife, Grace, went to college. She's got a bachelor's degree. I got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. One of our children decided to go to college and get a bachelor's degree. Another child decided to go to college and get a master's degree. Another child decided to go to college for a semester. That's different. Um, <laughs> they came home and they're like, my first economics class, they handed me Karl Marx and forgot to tell us that he was a mass murderer and I'm tired of arguing over pronouns. I'm not doing this anymore. Like, okay, well, that's different. That's different. And so, yeah, you get, well, I don't know, you're, you're clapping, but does that mean that my other children were wicked to go to college? Just something to think about. So, uh, right, cause you didn't clap for them. So 
But just different children are different. Um, and, and sometimes we as parents, we need to understand that the, the child is in the process of differentiating. I'll give you two more examples. Some years ago, um, our daughter came and said, hey, I prayed about it. And I feel like after graduation, I wanna take a gap semester, go to another country for, I don't know what it was, six months or something. And I wanna go to a Spanish speaking Bible college where they don't have internet access and you've never been and can't come. And I was like, well, surely this is not the will of the Lord. You're, eight, you're 18, okay? She's differentiating and I'm dying. That's what's happening. So I pray about it and I'm like, okay, Lord, do you want our daughter to go? And the Lord was like, yeah, she, she needs to go. Uh, okay, she's 18. Uh, she's going to another country that I've never been to and, and I'm not going with her. They speak a different language and her phone doesn't work very often, so I can't check in. That's differentiating. That's differentiating. Had another son uh, this last summer, he's 17. He's like, I wanna go to another state, get a job on a construction crew. I wanna learn how to build stuff and work with my hands. And I was like, you're 17, man. You can't rent a car. You can't rent a hotel. You're 17. He's like, yeah, and I'm going. I was like, okay, uh, praise the Lord. You know, so, uh, okay. So he went, you know, and the truth is we did go visit him. Just make sure he's, you know, living indoors. And, um, <laughs> And he's figured this out, but it was his way of saying, I, I just wanna get myself up, I wanna go to work, I wanna swing a hammer, and I wanna take responsibility for myself. That's differentiating. When it comes to differentiating, it means that the child becomes different than the other members of the family. This may mean that they move out and they have a different residence. They are no longer taking money from their parents, they have a different income, praise the Lord. Uh, this also means uh, that uh, they drive in a different car. When they're little, they're driving in your car. And, uh, and when you put them in a car and they drive for themselves, there can be some anxiety for the parent because now it's a different driver, one that doesn't know what they're doing and doesn't drive well <laughs> and tax on their driving, okay? And, and then eventually they get their own car. Now it's not just a different driver, it's a different car. And then the child comes to the point where they may come up with some different ideas. Maybe you're a Christian and they're a Christian, but they're reading the Bible and they're coming to some different conclusion on some issues. Uh, some people have asked me, they're like, does everybody in your family agree? No, not everybody in my marriage agrees. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are a, my wife is cracking up. We have very strong opinions. So pray for her. There's a handful of things she was wrong about. It needs to grow in. No, but we do disagree uh, because we come to some different conclusions. And what this means is when they get married, they're gonna have some different ideas about how to do their marriage, right? And if you open your mouth, they say, well, your mom and I, they're like, that's, that's exactly what I'm not doing. Um, <laughs> and, and when they have kids, they have a different idea of how to raise those kids, right? You're, you're, how many of you, this has been the case. You got very quiet. It was fun for a moment and we just <laughs> solved that problem. Um, and, what, and, and let me just say this, as a parent, sometimes when the children have a different idea, they're wrong. Really, no response? Um, okay, and as parents, you're like, that's not a good idea, but sometimes you need to give your children the differentiating opportunity to go ahead and field test their idea and then realize it's a bad idea. And as a parent, this can be frustrating. You're like, they don't listen. You're like, well, you remember when you were their age? You were differentiating and you had to learn some things through trial and error. That's part of the differentiating process. Now, what differentiation allows, it allows an option other than enmeshment, right? And cutoff. And many family systems, these are like the only two options you've got. You do everything we tell you to do. We do everything together, holidays, vacations. There's not good boundaries between the families or we're gonna cut you off. We're not gonna talk to you. Uh, you're cut out of the family will and inheritance. You're not invited over for the holidays. What differentiation allows is uh, there to be healthy people, which enmeshment doesn't allow, that are relationally connected, which cutoff doesn't allow. And I'll give you some examples um, from my own life, but I'll say as I'm teaching this series and it's getting some traction online by God's grace, uh, people are wondering, you know, so what? You can't spend time with your family? You can't do life with your family? Well, here's the question. How's your family? How's your family? I've seen healthy 
individuals with good boundaries and a healthy family system that have allowed leave and cleave differentiation. I've seen them share land and build a family homestead. I've seen them work together in a family business. I've seen them serve together in a church or ministry. I've seen them do holidays and vacations together. The question is not, what do we get to do? The question is, are we healthy in a healthy relationship with a healthy system? Yeah. Now, that being said, um, I'll give you an example from our own life. So we've got five kids. And when we first got married, Grace and I, she gravitated toward differentiation and I gravitated toward frustration. And so we, uh, we, we worked this out and then we got into a healthy balance and rhythm with our extended families who loved us. And what this allowed growing up for our kids was a, a really beautiful relationship with their grandparents. And so I wanna publicly honor Grace's parents, her daddy's in heaven, my parents who are probably watching, and growing up, um, every Friday, for example, our parents took turns watching the five kids so we could get a date night. It was awesome. We could absolutely depend on them. They made it the priority in their schedule. And then we would do holidays together. Sometimes we'd do vacations together. And also, uh, as the kids got older, the boys got into baseball. And uh, it was amazing and wonderful. And I, I miss going to baseball games. But one year I tallied it up, the three boys playing league and club ball had more games than a major league team. Three boys. Problem is none of them can drive and they're all having games at the same time in different places. Grace and I are like, okay, what do we do? So what the grandparents started doing, and this went for years, they'd say, just give us the schedule. One side of the grandparents would take one of the boys to their tournament. The other grandparents would take the boy to their tournament. Uh, we'd take one of the boys to their tournament and we'd rotate. And what this allowed was lots of time with the grandparents. And they were very loving and present. Afterward, they would take them out to dinner or lunch or go get ice cream. Sometimes the tournaments were out of state and the grandparents would literally take the grandson and go out of state and invest in them. And, and we have a healthy relationship my folks were just in town, my mom and dad, and uh, it was great to see them. They stayed at our house and it was wonderful to get time with them. We love them, they love the Lord, they're good to us, they, they bless us. Uh, as well, as I've traveled internationally over the years, we actually brought um, the grandparents, I'll give you a couple examples. We went to Greece, Israel and Turkey and we brought both sides, Grace's mom and my mom and dad. We went to the places where Jesus taught and we looked at the land of the Bible with our kids and the grandparents got to learn the Bible as we're doing a tour with the grandkids, which is awesome. We, I got to see, I got to baptize my mom and dad in the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized. I got to baptize my son Calvin at the time as well. Lifelong sacred memories. You know why we could do that? Because our parents love us and we can talk it through, we can work it out. They respect us, they support us, and it is mutual. And there are times that we've traveled internationally when I have speaking engagements internationally and go on tour, we brought my mother-in-law. Uh, she went to Scotland with us for weeks. She went to Australia with us for a month. And some people are like, are you saying you have to take your mother with you on international trips? <laughs> Am I? It depends on your relationship. She's godly, she's loving, she treats me like a son, we get along great. I'm like, I'd love to have her. She's super helpful with the kids and she honors our marriage and family. So what I'm not, some of you will hear some of this, you'll be like, Mark's trying to break apart the family. No, Mark wants the family to be healthy before it breaks apart. Amen. Just want it to be healthy, that's all. Yeah. All right, both of you like that. Um, so I, I could sense I'm, I'm losing here, I'm losing. Uh, so, so now I'll start talking about Jesus. Uh, so, um, so then the question is, and some of you would think like, okay, we're talking about counseling and principles. Well, what does the Bible have to say? Well, okay, let's just go to Jesus, okay? When all else fails, go to Jesus. That's what I'm telling you. And before all else fails, get to Jesus. And so Jesus is our God. He entered into human history and a family. We talked about this in the last sermon. And he never sinned. So how he interacted with his family, well, that'd be really something helpful for us to examine. So Jesus began differentiating at the age of 12. I'll prove it to you. Uh, Luke says this, we'll read a little scripture. Uh, 21, or excuse me, 41 through 51. Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, went to Jerusalem, the big city, every year at the Feast of Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went. When the feast was ended, 
as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? You gave me a heart attack. Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And then he went down with them, came to Nazareth, was submissive to them, and his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Here's the story. Big holiday, everybody gets together, big caravan and journey, going to Jerusalem for the holiday. So you've got neighbors and family and friends and relatives, they all go together. Now it's over, time to go home. Mary and Joseph are headed home. And she's like, have you seen Jesus? <laughs> no, nope. I haven't seen him either. Where is he? They lost Jesus. Okay, let me say this. <laughs> like, this is a major potential issue, amen? Like, God's like, hey, I need you to raise my son. They're like, oh, you lost him, okay? Um, they lost Jesus. Can I just say, and if you hear this and you're thinking, I can't believe that, let me just tell you something. You've never had a child. That's what I know. Because <laughs> here's what I'm telling you. This is, I'm not prophesying this and I'm not endorsing this. But if you have a child at some point, you're going to lose that child. I'm just telling you, that's how it works. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Okay, now we hope you find them, you know, uh, but you're going to lose them. They lose Jesus, right? So now they're frantic. They're like, okay, we can't find, they go back to town. Can you imagine the conversation? I'm like, oh, if we lose them, like, what happens? Like, like I don't know. We got to find them, you know? So, uh, so they find Jesus and his mom is just anxious. Can you sense this in mom? She's like, what in the world were you doing? He's like, well, you wanted to go home and I didn't. Uh, what we wanted was different. This is differentiation. She's like, I didn't want to go home. I wanted to sit here and argue the Bible with all the scholars even though I'm 12, right? Because I'm ready, right? They're like, no, 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 we wanted you to go home with us, okay? So uh, let me read a, a clinical textbook on family systems. When one member of a family can calmly state his own convictions and beliefs and take actions on his own convictions without criticism of the beliefs of others, and without becoming involved in emotional debate, then other family members will start the same process of becoming more sure of self and more accepting of others. That's exactly what Jesus is doing. Did he get emotional? No. Was he disrespectful? No. He's like, you wanted to go home, I didn't. We're different. Okay. Oh, the moms are giving me the stink eye. Um, <laughs> I think you see where this is going, okay? Um, did Jesus ever sin? No. In this moment, did he disagree with his parents? Yes. Just because a child is disagreeing doesn't mean they're sinning. There's a big difference between differentiating and sinning. Jesus is here not sinning, but he is differentiating. You see that? And he's beginning, he's in this differentiation process. He's 12. Now, was Jesus dishonoring? No. Uh, was he submissive to his parents? Yes, at the very end, it says he went home with them and he submitted to his parents' authority. So he's not sinning, but he is differentiating. As children are growing up, there is something in a, the spirit of a religious parent that says, unless you agree with me, you're in sin. Well, there is a sin uh, there is the issue and category of sin, but there is also the category of differentiating. They're not sinning, they're just different than you. They're coming to some different conclusions. They have some different desires. And so here's what I want you to know. Two things that will hinder differentiation is overparenting and underparenting. Overparenting is enmeshment. And enmeshment does not allow the child to differentiate, to grow up, to become an individual and an adult. Um, usually, as we've established, uh, overparenting occurs, let me ask you, by the mother or father? By the mother. 
because she is the caregiver when the child is little, but as the child gets bigger, she needs to stop caregiving so much and let them start to carry some of their own responsibility. That's where sometimes there's a tension in child raising where mom's like, that's my baby. And dad's like, that's a grown man, okay? And I can't get into all of this just for time's sake, but if you do the family systems workbook, you really need to pay attention to chapter 16 um, called the Satanic Six. And it's the six ways that Satan is destroying young men in our culture. And then chapter 17, which is making men and how to raise a boy to be a man. Um, and these concepts are, it's kind of interesting. Uh, they're really getting some traction. I've talked about this for years, but even this week, I wanna thank him publicly. Ben Shapiro gave me a shout out and liked some of these things that I'm sharing. I'm like, great, and I love you, Ben, and you need Jesus. So anyways, um, <laughs> like we love a Jewish guy. You gotta meet him, he's amazing. Uh, he'll change your life. And so, and we love you too. So we'd love you to meet Jesus. But nonetheless, um, what this looks like in our culture where it's over-parenting and enmeshment that doesn't allow differentiation. I'll, I'll, I'll share it briefly. Uh, I saw a guy at the grocery store recently with his mom. He was like mid to late twenties. Um, he just woke up at like the crack of noon. You could tell cause he had bed head. He was wearing his pajamas at the store and a mask. Okay. And he was with his mother and she drove him to the store and he was asking her if he could get various snacks to put in her cart that she could pay with, with her money to put in her car to drive to her house uh, to feed her worthless son. So they were having this time together. And I thought to myself, you know what? You need to put pants on and take the mask off. It's time to differentiate. It's time to differentiate, okay? All the moms are yeah and all the guys are like, it's comfortable. Okay, anyways, um, yeah. The other way that we harm differentiation is underparenting or cut off. Sometimes this happens when the child is growing up and the parents are not present and active. You're like, you didn't tell them anything, you didn't prepare them. How many of you, you go to dinner and there's a little kid watching a screen, they've got a screen in front of them and the parents aren't even interacting with them. It's like they need a parent not a good Wi-Fi connection, right? And so sometimes there's under parenting and then when the child gets older, they're not ready to differentiate and launch because they haven't been trained. Right. The other stupid thing that we do, and we do a lot of stupid things in our culture, but one of the stupid things that we do is we, uh, we cut kids off at 18. Yeah. Okay, parents, let me just ask you, on their 18th birthday, do they become a full functioning mature adult? No. <laughs> no. If you're 17, you're like, yes, we do. You're adorable, okay? No, you don't. And it's fine to say at this age, you can drive, at this age, you can vote, at this age, you can buy alcohol, but just because someone is of a certain age doesn't mean they're of a certain maturity. I've seen immature 46-year-old men and I've seen mature 16-year-old young men. And so what we do at 18, we're like, well, you're an adult now. No, they're not fully cooked, right? They need more time in the microwave, right? They're, they're not cooked yet. And what this means is at 18, you don't stop parenting, but you're parenting someone who's in the process of differentiating to become an adult. So you parent them a little differently. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, some years ago, I was in Colorado and I was talking to a pastor, this was many years ago. Nice guy, loved Jesus, loved his family, loved the scriptures. And I just asked him, I said, is there anything I can pray for you about? Anything I can pray for you about? And he's like, uh, yeah, it came out of him. He's like, pray for my daughter. She's 18, she's in a relationship. I don't like the guy, I don't like where it's going. My wife and I are really worried. You know, this is, uh, this is concerning for us. So I asked him, I said, well, when you've talked to her about it, what does she say? He said, well, we haven't directly talked about it. We've kind of hinted about it. I said, why? He said, she's 18, she's an adult. She gets to make her own decisions. I was like, whoa. So first of all, if you don't say anything, she probably assumes that you're supportive. In addition, she's never been married. So she doesn't exactly know what the best choice is for marriage. And just because she's 18 doesn't mean you can't still be her dad and that can't be her mom and you can't have a conversation with her. He's like, you think so? I was like, no, I know so. Because the most important decision you make is who you worship. The second most important decision is who you marry. 
If they make that mistake, that will cause pain for the rest of their life. And for multiple generations, you'll have a broken system. I said, just because she's 18 doesn't mean that you don't have a voice. You don't have a, a way of speaking into her life and her future decision-making. Uh, let me proceed. Uh, Jesus differentiated and he had to differentiate to lead. We're still on our theme of differentiation. Um, let me read the scripture to you. Uh, Mark chapter three, 21, and then 31 through 35. Jesus, family heard it. So Jesus is saying, I'm God. I came down from heaven. I'm without sin. I'm gonna rise from the dead and I'm gonna go to heaven and I'm gonna open heaven. They went out to seize him for they were saying, what? He's out of his mind. Like Jesus needs mental health. He needs mental health immediately. And his mother and his brothers, his father is absent. Many think he probably died somehow before this time. And Jesus here is a grown man in his thirties. Standing outside, they sent to him and called him and a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered, who are my mother and brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and brothers for whoever does the will of God, he is my, he's speaking spiritually, brother and sister and mother. So here's what happens. Jesus is publicly saying, I'm God and his family thinks he's lost his mind. So the family has a meeting. We gotta go get Jesus to shut down his ministry. He thinks he's God, he's lost it. So then the enmeshed family all comes together. This is an intervention. And now there are one of two choices. Jesus follows his family or the family follows Jesus. Those are the options. And the question is, is Jesus going to be enmeshed with his family? I don't want conflict or tension or separation. So I'm just gonna go home and be with my family and shut down my ministry so that I can be enmeshed with my family. Or am I going to differentiate? Am I gonna do things differently than what my family wants? Cause I'm a grown man and an adult in my thirties. And Jesus is here establishing himself as a leader. And he started this early in his ministry by telling people, come follow me. Jesus doesn't follow, he leads and people follow him. That's a leader. So in this instance, Jesus is differentiating and he's saying, I love my family, but I'm not going to be enmeshed with my family. My family thinks some things and I'm different. I think some different things. They want me to shut my ministry down and I plan on going global. They're different, he's differentiated. Um, let me say this. You cannot be a leader unless you're differentiated. Good. You can't be. If you're fully enmeshed in a group, there is no leader. Yeah. There's no one that has a different idea or a different plan or a different perspective. And it's groupthink and it's fear of man and it's unhealth and dysfunction and sometimes rises to the level of codependence. And what happens when you have enmeshment, they don't allow a leader to differentiate. And if they do, there's a lot of pressure to be enmeshed and come back into the group. Hey, don't, don't think different, don't act different, don't do different, just, just remain uh, connected with us. And there's this powerful force that is at work trying to pull us into uh, relationships that may not be the healthiest for us. Even in nature, you've got prides and swarms and flocks and schools. And it is that even in the animal kingdom, they'll stick together for safety and security. There's something in us that wants that same thing. And to differentiate is to separate. And you risk being cut off. Well, what if the group or the family what if they cut me off? What if my choices are enmeshment or cut off? And most people will go back to enmeshment because they don't want to endure cut off. This is where the leaders have the courage, the, the nerve, the stamina, the, the fortitude, the pain tolerance to say, I love you, but I'm differentiating. And I'm gonna do some things different and I'm forging a different path. You're welcome to follow me but I'm not following you. That's a leader. Had Jesus not differentiated here with his family, the church of Jesus Christ would not exist. Salvation would not exist. The fulfillment of the scriptures would not exist. If Jesus' family is right, he should have went home, but they were wrong, so he moved on. In addition, 
This explains why we are as a culture lacking leadership at every level. We're lacking leadership in business, we're lacking leadership in politics, we're lacking leadership in church because the family systems in our culture are broken. And we either have enmeshment or cutoff. We don't have family systems that allow the next generation to differentiate. And as a result, we're not getting any leaders. And so this is a generational crisis. If you don't allow your children to differentiate, none of them will become leaders and your family will not be healthy. What happens in an enmeshed family system, and family can include a work group, a ministry group, a friend group, a business association, or whatever the case may be. This can get all the way to denominations and networks and whole collectives of Christians. But what happens is, if it's an enmeshed group, then the least healthy person decides what happens because they're the most emotional and they're the most hurt and they're the most triggered and they're the most vulnerable. So, so they're the most emotional and they're the most vocal. And if you allow the least healthy person in an enmeshed group to make the decisions, all you're doing is slowly bringing about the demise and the death of the group. That's where a differentiated leader gets out and says, this isn't working. We're gonna do some things different. We could use this in politics, true or false? Like, give me, give me an option, please. Like, uh, could we use this in business? Some differentiated leaders that were pioneering some new ideas and willing to take some risks, 100%. Could we use this in ministry? People who are saying, you know what? I'm willing to say what the Bible says, even if I'm criticized by the mob and the majority, I'll call the shots, take the shots. You can cut me off and cancel me, but I'm gonna be faithful to Christ. This is differentiation. Um, and, and let me say this uh, to our church family. Um, we must allow differentiation, but not rebellion, okay? Differentiation and rebellion are, they're different. Rebellion is sin. Differentiation is maturing. It's part of the process. So when you come into our church, if you're here at Trinity or you're joining us online, I like to say we have closed-handed issues and open-handed issues. The closed-handed issues are what cause us uh, to be God's children and part of his family. The Bible is God's word. Uh, there's one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus is fully God, fully man, born of a virgin, lived without sin, died on the cross, rose from the dead. He's the way, the truth, and life, and no one gets to the Father but by him, okay? Amen. Closed-handed, okay? Amen. And then differentiation is, there's some open-handed issues, and in the family, eh, you can disagree on these things, but you're still family. We don't cut you off over these issues. If you deny these things, you're a heretic, you're apostate, you start a cult or another religion, we have to cut you off. There's a difference between sinning and differentiating. Yeah. So in our church, some people think that the earth is old and some think that it's young. And it's definitely probably one of those, you know? Um, and, and, and in our, well, this is even true in our marriage. And so, um, and so, but even some people, they say, I like this translation of the Bible. Others say, I like that translation of the Bible. Okay, that's great. Some people have strong opinions about how and when and where Jesus will return. And others are like, I don't know. Uh, I'm on the welcome committee, not the planning committee. I don't know, you know? Uh, and, and so as a church, what allows us to remain together as a family is a core set of unchanging convictions. And then what allows us to be a growing, learning, thinking, maturing church family, a differentiating church family is having open-handed issues. Like, oh, we came to a different conclusion, but I love you. Let's talk about it and see if we can't learn from each other. In addition, as a church family, we have to allow in our church family what we are hopefully exercising in our biological extended family, the differentiation of the next generation. Just like raising kids, you're like, well, they're differentiating. In the church, as next generation rises up, they have to be given permission to differentiate. They gotta figure out their own faith. They gotta come to their own convictions. Maybe they wanna do worship differently. Maybe the way they wanna do their sermon prep and teaching is different. Maybe their service order is different. Maybe their songs are different. And that's not rebellion, that's maturing, right. okay? And so as a church family, we, and for those of us who are older, now that I'm grandpa, when you look at generations that are younger, if you are mature, you should be more flexible. 
Okay? Because, for example, like uh, I've got grandsons. What I don't expect them to do is accommodate me because they're a few months old. So instead I have to accommodate them. If I looked at them and I was like, all right, here's what I need you to do. Then they would just throw up and not do that. That's what would happen. So if you're older in a family or a church family, the older you get, the more flexible you should become on things that are matters of differentiation, but not sinning, okay? And sometimes, I I just feel inclined in the spirit. This isn't in my notes. But sometimes you gotta decide, uh, do we want our traditions or do we want our children? And many churches choose their traditions and lose their children. No, we wanna be a growing, maturing, flexible church family that allows differentiation so that all those kids in kids ministry and student ministry and young adults and emerging generations, they can come into leadership and give the gospel of Jesus Christ a future. That being said, um, Jesus taught differentiation. I'll I'll read you the verse that uh, that most people just really don't like, okay? And there's others, but, but this is one of them. What I don't want you to do is weaponize this verse. If you're bitter or have unforgiveness, you're gonna read this verse and be like, that's my new life verse, I hate my family. Uh, okay. And I want you to do that. But here's, uh, here's where Jesus taught differentiation, I'll explain it. Uh, Matthew 10, 34 through 37. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's prophetic. That has happened. Um, And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. And here's his interpretation. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Here's what Jesus is saying. you have to maintain your God-given priorities. So for example, um, my first priority is my relationship with God. That's my first priority. Prayer, Bible reading, listening to the Holy Spirit, being aware of God's presence and leading in my life. My relationship with God is my first priority. Let me say this, if I'm not right with God, I'm not helpful to anybody. It's like, if I don't get with the Lord, then he doesn't pour into me what I can then pour out to help other members of my family. My next priority is my wife, Grace. Uh, She was there before the children. And right, honey, you're gonna be there after they leave. So, um, so, you know, amen. Okay, good. I was a little nervous. Glad we got that cleared up and on film. And so, um, And then the next priority is our five kids. And now that they're married, uh, three of them are, their marriages and their families and their spouses. But now what we have is four families and uh, as well as our our, our children that are yet unmarried. And then after that, my next priority relationally is our, our, our grandsons. And then after that, it's our church family and our extended family. And if I take any of these God-given assigned priorities and I invert them, what I'm creating is a broken system that's gonna hurt generations. Like you need to know this, like I love you and I love being your pastor. I love teaching you the Bible, but you're not in my top few priorities. Like at the end of the day, if it's like, Mark, you need to shipwreck your marriage so that you can grow the church. Nope because I believe if I focus on my priorities that God gave me, that God could multiply the ministry that he's called me to, right? And so at the end of the day, what Jesus is talking about is, are you living by your God-given priorities? Um, And what happens then is, as you maintain your God-given priorities, what you're setting is a pattern of health. So that as your kids and grandkids grow up, they're seeing, okay, this isn't a perfect family system, but it's healthy and it honors God's priorities. And then it gives them a pattern for marriage and family. This is where our whole culture is broken. They don't say anything about marriage, parenting, family, and family systems. You can get all the way through graduation and know nothing about what to do with the rest of your life. That being said, uh, I've got a little bit of time just here uh, at the end, and I wanna make this as practical as I can. So in the few moments I've got remaining, um, I just wanna share some very practical things for parents and children to just consider. Um, 
there's a big difference between secrecy and privacy. And this is part of the differentiation process. When your children are really little, do they have any privacy? No. You strip them naked um, just whenever you want. You're like, as a general rule, you can't do this to other people. Um, and then you put them in a bathtub and then you rub them. And you don't ask them, like, are you good with this? Okay. okay. They don't have any privacy, okay? And let me say this, if you're watching and you have a child in their 20s and this is happening, call 911 and can cancel the live stream at this point, okay? As a child get, and, and so a child doesn't have a lot of privacy. So now they're growing up and you monitor their technology and their friend group and where they go. But when they differentiate and become adults, they get a lot of privacy. Secrecy is I'm hiding something that's bad. Privacy is it's not your business. True or false, when a child differentiates and becomes an adult, let's say gets married and starts their own family, are there certain things that they just don't need to tell their parents? Yes. yes. Like, how's your sex life? <laughs> oh, well, I'll tell you, uh, it's none of your business. And if you ask again, um, we will do a timeout, okay? <laughs> Sometimes the parents, they want to know information. It's like, that's not your business, like, right, right? That's not your business. If we want you to know, we'll tell you, and we don't. Right? Here's another one. Uh, there's a big difference in parenting between control and influence. When a child is little, you have a lot of control, right? You literally take the child, you pick them up. You decide where they go. You put them in a sling. You lock them in a car seat, boom. You, you're, you're now, they're not in control. As a child gets older, do you start to lose control? Yes. 100%. Now what happens then is some parents double down on control. If they do, they're only allowing their child two options, enmeshment, do what we say, or cut off, leave, and don't have a relationship with us. Differentiation says, as the child gets older, you're moving from control to influence, to influence. And influence has to be in the context of relationship. You're an adult, we're gonna talk about this, we're gonna pray about this, we're gonna be in the process together and put some grace on it. Um, what happens when you have uh, controlling parents, they will control through emotion. Somebody will create a lot of emotion and then it causes anxiety and everybody in the family is like, just do what they want so they stop being so emotional. It's manipulation. Sometimes they will do so through triangles. They'll get somebody involved so that they can control and triangulate the relationships to get what they want. Sometimes uh, people will uh, seek to exercise control by threatening cutoff. You better do this or you're out. You can't, you can't be part of the family anymore. Uh, in addition, sometimes control comes in the form of hyper-spirituality, right? The Lord told us, really? Well, tell him to give me a call. You know, I'm listening. You know, why I, you know this is what you need to do because I'm now your mediator between you and God. And sometimes the way that controlling parents operate is through money and finances or possessions and wealth. They're like, I will give money if I get to be in control. I'll give you money if you buy a house where I want you to buy a house. I'll give you money if you put your kids in the school I want them to go to. I will give you money if you go to the college that I've chosen for you. And all of a sudden what happens then is the money becomes the controlling factor where the older generation then controls the younger generation. Here's what I would say. If you're a parent, if you don't trust them, don't fund them. If you don't trust them, don't fund them. And if you're a child or an adult child of a controlling parent, if the money comes with any strings, don't take the money because they'll become the marionette and you'll become the puppet. Yeah. Another one, um, a good way to have differentiation is you're talking about boundaries. And your property has a boundary and your family needs to have some boundaries. So. You know, you've got your house. You're like, there's a fence usually between you and the neighbor. They say good neighbors, good fences make good neighbors. 
It's like, well, that's your property. This is my property. So you can't just come over here and I can't come over there. Just like you have boundaries for your property, you need to have boundaries for your family. That's your family. This is our family. We're different. That's your house. This is our house. We're different. This is our car. That's your car. We're different. This is our money. That's your money. You're, we're different. And the boundaries then help the families to be independent and then interconnected where they agree to. What happens, um, let me explain how this works in our, fa- our extended family. So um, our kids all have a key to our house. We don't have a key to their houses. If we're not home, they need something, let yourself in. But I'm not going to your house and taking stuff. In addition, um, the kids can come over anytime they want. They don't have to announce it. We don't show up at their house unless we're invited or it's agreed upon. Because that's their house. And it's weird if they come home and I'm in their house. (laughs) Amen? It's weird. And if I just walk into their house, I'm like, oh, I can't unsee what's happening. You know, so I don't, wanna, I don't wanna be involved. Boundary, I'll be home, text me if you wanna see me and I'll show up late just to be safe, right? I just, and so a couple of other things too, um, like in a family group text, prayer requests, good news, funny stories, but let's say you're having conflict. The last thing you wanna do, the last, zero, Family conflicts have been resolved through lengthy text wars, zero, okay? How many of you, when you get the family group text, like, ah, Jesus, come back now, right now, get me out of this. And what that is, is you've gotta, you've gotta have a boundary and say, no, 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 what our technology is used for blessing, prayer requests, sharing news, not disagreeing and fighting and attacking. And I'll say this as well, I've said it, but I'll repeat it. Any family member who takes a private matter and posts it on the internet is sinning. And they're violating the Bible's commands of gossiping and busybodying because now they're inviting the universe into the family conflict. It's treacherous behavior. And I would say a few things as well on this issue of boundaries. In a relationship, the parents and the children should pursue each other, especially as you get older. But I this is what I've told our children, that the primary responsibility is the parents to pursue the children, especially the adult children. A lot of times parents are like, you never call, you don't pursue me. Like I'm a differentiated person trying to launch and live my life and start my career and start my family. And if you wanna get lunch, say, hey, I wanna get lunch and pursue the child. And a lot of times parents have unspoken expectations that go unmet and then they get hurt and offended. And what they instead need to do is take initiative and to pursue the child. Hey, let's do lunch, let's do coffee. When's a good time for you? Hey, let's go, I'll buy tickets, let's hang out at the game. And let me say this to the older folks, the parents, you pay for it. If you want time with them, make it cheap and easy. When works for you, I'll pay. I'm just telling these two things increase your odds. I'll just tell you, that's what I've experienced. <laughs> when works for you, I'll pay. And it's pursuing your own, uh, your own child for relationship. Uh, in addition, this one will be uh, controversial. Um, so there's a proverb that says, a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. My encouragement, now some people love the Lord and they're poor. Jesus' parents were poor. I'm not, I'm not making any economic statement, but I'm saying as parents, we wanna leave an inheritance. That, that inheritance is spiritual and it's also financial. Spiritual, it should be wisdom. But financial, usually there's an inheritance of some sort or kind that comes to the next generation. My encouragement to the parents would be, get the inheritance to your children earlier rather than later. So like I'm, I'm 53. I know I don't look a day over 70, but I'm 53. <laughs> and, uh, and so let's say I've got 30 years left. Well, in 30 years, my kids who are in their 20s, they don't need the money unless they really make some bad life decisions. Instead, when is most helpful? Let me ask the young people. When is it most helpful to get an economic jumpstart? When, when you get married. Yeah. The front row, very loud and clear. <laughs> Amen, brother. Um, okay. And so um, here's what I always told the kids. Like, 
you know, don't go into credit card debt, don't go into car debt, don't go into college debt. That's the beast, the false prophet, and the antichrist. Don't do that. Um, and then when you get married, own a home as early as possible so that you can start to build equity and the first domino begins to fall for multi-generational wealth. So if you're an older parent, it's like, well, let's help them here so that they can make momentum throughout the course of life economically. And so these are the kind of things that you can think about, tools, not rules, but for a family system. What are the priorities and what are the decisions and what are, what are the ways that we're architecting? I'll give you a few more. Can we do a few more? Yeah. A few more, are you good with that? I mean, it's, yeah. it's yeah. just so you know, I'm now over time, or as I like to call it, right on time. And so I'll give you two more. I, I say this a lot uh, when, not my news to tell. In a family where there's differentiation and boundaries, sometimes there are people that don't have information that they want to have about other members of the family. Right. And so what they do, they triangle, they go, well, do you know what's going on with them? And here's what I like to say, that's not my news to tell. If you wanna know about them, guess what? Ask them, ask them. And if they want you to know, they'll tell you. And if they don't tell you, you're not gonna know, but you can pray. Because even when you don't know what is happening, God does. And even when you feel like it's out of your hands, it's in his hand. And this is where the older your children get, the more you learn to pray. Yeah. But it's not my news to tell. Lastly, a um, couple of things that I would say are very healthy to allow differentiation and a healthy family system. Number one, is a weekly calendar meeting with your spouse. Okay? Grace and I, Monday, we have our weekly calendar meeting. Because if you're going to maintain your God-given priorities and have a healthy family system, that has to be done intentionally. Yeah. Right? We've got, I've got Real Faith, I've got Trinity Church, two full-time jobs. Uh, I've got a wife, five kids, three of whom are married, a couple of grandkids. You know, if I don't intentionally architect my life, it's a disaster. And so just like you need to have a budget, you also need to have a schedule. And both of those need to reflect your God-given priorities. So Grace and I meet every Monday and we do our schedule. What's going on? You know, how do we open space for the kids? You know, what, what do we got going on? Holidays, vacations, all these kind of things. In addition, we do an annual vision retreat. This is in the workbook and the, the link is there for Pastor Jimmy Evans' annual vision retreat. And our kids who are married tend to do this as well. It's like, okay, for this year, what do we want for our family? Praying and listening. Lord, what do you want for our family this year? And then architecting the schedule and budget. And then thirdly, uh, when the families wanna do something together, because now our extended family is four families, we get together and have family meeting. Like, what do you guys wanna do for Christmas? Let's talk about this. What do you guys wanna do for Thanksgiving? You're gonna be out of town? Okay, great. You know, hey, what do you guys wanna, we're gonna take this trip, does anybody wanna go? And it, it's a lot of conversation and invitation. The worst thing that can happen is one person who is a controlling uh, influence in the family just tells all the other families what we're doing. No. Because at that point, you're only allowing enmeshment or cutoff, not differentiation. Like, oh, I think I got a different idea for Christmas. Can we talk about that? I got a different idea for Thanksgiving. Can we talk about that? I have, I have a different idea for the wedding that's coming up or I have a different idea uh, for what the children need in the next generation. Let me bring the band up and close with this. Uh, let me ask one question. Uh, do you know Jesus Christ? Because the first thing is, if you're hearing all this on family, you're like, where do I start? Start by joining God's family, yeah. okay? Once you join God's family, then he's gonna help you figure out how to do family. So if you're not someone who belongs to Jesus Christ and believes in Jesus Christ, he is the son of God. He came down, lived without sin. He died for our sin. He rose from the grave to defeat sin and death. He's alive and well right now. His ears and heart are open in heaven. He'll forgive your sin and adopt you into God's family. Okay? That's, that's where we start. Um, number two, for those of you who are children, start with forgiveness 
and gratefulness. Your parents didn't do it right and you won't either. You want your family system for generations to be one that starts with gratitude. Here's the things I'm thankful for. And forgiveness. Here are the things that I'm not going to choose bitterness regarding. And put some grace on your parents. Uh, the older I get, the more aware of the ways I have failed. And if a parent has a functioning conscience, they understand this. In addition, if you're a parent, here's what you can do. I'm sorry. You can just own it. Yep. I'm sorry. Now knowing what I know, I would have done it differently when I was raising you. Now the person that I've become is a better version. And I wish you would have had that as your father or mother in those formative years. And it can unlock healing and the flow of the Holy Spirit for generations if you just own the things as a parent that were wrong and then God can bring grace so that the relationship can be made right. I'll just close with this and I'm gonna ask as we go into a time of worship and I'll pray for you and we'll release the live stream. Um, this is where I need you to meet with the Lord. We're gonna invite the Holy Spirit. What is he saying to you? What is he convicting you of? What do you need to repent of? Who do you need to forgive? What broken system do you need to correct? What change is God stirring in you so that there can be a better future for you and your family? I want you to hear from him and meet with him now. Holy Spirit, we invite you. Uh, we invite you to everyone who is giving me the honor of teaching them the word of God today. Uh, Lord, we know that you love family and we know that Satan hates family. We know that you try to build family and he tries to break family. So we pray against the enemy, his servants, their works and the facts. We pray against the generational curses and strongholds. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to bring renewing and healing, repentance, forgiveness, hope, vision. God, we're on the threshold of a new year and nothing changes unless you change us and our perspective. Holy Spirit, we just invite you right now. What would you have to say to each person? What would you have to give or impart to each person? And we invite your presence in ministry now in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for letting me teach the series.